Hey, Cypher here. This one is complicated, but maybe good because of that? This is a divisive topic to say the least. The mere mention of the Waco Siege and Ruby Ridge will inevitably bring out the conspiracists. But my duty is not to engage with lunatics. I'm trying to understand how this show affects the viewers, whether negatively or positively, and whether it could be better. On both counts, this show comes out fairly well. So what exactly happened in Waco, Texas in 1993? As a bit of an editorial note, I am going to be using the word cult. This is necessarily a negative phrase, which a channel named Religion for Breakfast has an excellent video describing. But it is not meant to be delegitimizing, but instead descriptive, for it is the most common term used at the time. Having taken a poll on Twitter, it seems as though most people will agree with the use of the term cult, so I will continue to use it throughout this review. A fringe break-off group of the Seventh-day Adventists had been created in 1930. They eventually ended up in Waco. They were millenarians following a lineage that claimed to be a final messianic figure. The cult had various leaders. When it split up in 1955, one group called themselves the Branch Davidians. The troubles with leadership didn't end there. When a young up-and-comer named David Koresh rose to prominence in 1987, the current leader named George Roden challenged him by exhuming a body. Koresh left and returned with an armed band of men, but nothing came of it. He instead set up his own sect, making this the third break from the Seventh-day Adventists. Koresh started gathering weapons, most likely to sell at gun shows. He also pronounced that God told him all the men in the sect were to be celibate, while Koresh himself would take on the burden of having sex with all the women, including some preteens. This was seen as crazy stuff, but he continued for years before the ATF got involved. The ATF in 1993 came to execute a warrant to search the Branch Davidian compound in Waco. It was botched and a shootout ensued. A 51-day siege was instead put up around the compound. The FBI took over and tried to negotiate with the Davidians. Several dozen of them did come out, but most remained devout to Koresh. Negotiations continued, but Koresh violated his word about coming out after releasing his video. And then again, he failed to show proof that he was working on a later compromise to release a manuscript of his theology. The decision was made to gas them out. Tanks penetrated the walls and dumped CS gas into the compound. They also shot numerous gas grenades. This too was botched, and the compound caught fire. Most of the Davidians died. This became a rallying cry for the nascent private militia movement and doomsday preppers. It came on the heels of another incident at Ruby Ridge, Idaho, where another ATF and FBI siege was botched. The militia movement has become the foundation for far-right sentiment that has continued to this day. Now, it's not like these people only came about because of Waco and Ruby Ridge. After all, both incidents had been based on things the FBI had learned because they had gone after the white supremacist cult called the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord. The CSA, as it was called, were a bunch of militant racists set up in an Arkansas compound. The CSA had a siege themselves in 1985, which was successfully negotiated down under overwhelming force from the FBI and ATF. So Waco and Ruby Ridge were just botched versions of that. But screwing up raids and getting people killed tends to anger the public to the point of lunacy, hence why these incidents basically kick-started the militia movement. The anger and conspiracism inspiring those movements led to the Oklahoma City bombing on the second anniversary of Waco which was the worst act of domestic terrorism in U.S. history. That is what conspiracy theories inspire. Along the same vein, I'll bet you will inevitably see folks in the comments below talking about how the government was conspiring to kill the Davidians. But you will also notice that I have not said who is to blame, because I deal with evidence, not unfounded accusations. Just as with most things that the conspiracists want to mythologize, they do so only by negating evidence. Something as disastrous as Waco has inspired unending investigation. You have to be careful not to fall into some rabbit hole that looks good, but ultimately is founded on denialism. 
It is a core tenet of a conspiracy theory that there is some kind of official truth that, if denied, reveals the conspiracy. What the heck an official story is, is not really clarified. Something something, the government is out to get ya! So with all that flurry of ignorance, this is a difficult subject to tackle. You have to be wary of conspiracism and not become one yourself in the process. There are two unanswered questions that have brought on the most conspiracism. One is who shot first, the ATF or the Branch Davidians? This question haunts much of the discourse. The courts did convict some of the Davidians for voluntary manslaughter, a few of which were in prison until 2007. Even though there were problems with the hearings that lessened sentences, the courts said, The record is replete with evidence of a conspiracy to murder federal agents and each individual defendant's membership in that conspiracy. Yeah, the government can be a bunch of conspiracists too. But this was way more public than mere court hearings. Congressional investigations followed. Something that a lot of people don't seem to understand about congressional investigations is that they are published openly. That's the point. Every shred of evidence used, every testimony given, even dissenting opinions given, they're all there. In this case, we have footage of it too. These things are a wonderful resource for investigating these matters. But if you go to the 13-hour episode that I made a while back, you'll see a bunch of denialists complaining, I believe the guys on the ground, not the politicians. Well, if these commenters had even a cursory understanding of what a congressional investigation means, then they would understand that they are contradicting themselves because the testimony of the guys on the ground was part of the report. So basically, these people are saying, I don't believe the findings of hundreds of investigators because they are using the thing that somehow proves what I want to say. But my Benghazi! The same kind of rhetoric surrounds the Waco investigations. The fact is, there is no such thing as the official story. Unlike the 13 hours episode, I'm not sitting through the hearings on this one. I just went through a couple books on the subject, but I'll link to the published investigations below in case you want to look at the primary sources yourself. On the first question though, Congress was not as conclusive as the courts, though they were very forgiving toward the ATF. In all, we can't answer this question conclusively. The other major question looming over this is who started the fire? And as I said with the previous question, we can't be conclusive. There is some evidence that the Davidians poured fuel on the floor to immolate themselves, but the survivors have fiercely disputed this. There is also some evidence that the grenades used by the FBI were able to start a fire. You'll find people convinced of both. But that's the thing with contradictory evidence. People get to choose what they believe, but that does not prove one way or the other. Ultimately, we cannot answer these questions, and to pretend that we can is to not understand how history is made. The show uses two books itself, though not mine. I normally try to isolate my topics by avoiding the same sourcing, especially if they are merely memoirs, such as these two. One is a memoir from the FBI negotiator, and the other is from one of the cult members who escaped the Inferno. These two were actually on set, and spent a lot of time working with the production for accuracy's sake. But there is another obvious influence the show seems to purposefully avoid stating, despite it being quoted multiple times. That is the documentary called Waco Rules of Engagement. The documentary has been divisive to say the least. For instance, many of the quotes used in the show are taken out of context because the documentary did so in 1997. The documentary also tries to bring in some circumstantial evidence with FLIR analysis that has often been considered bunk by experts. And worst of all, they falsify where bodies were found, showing gruesome depictions of corpses. It's not a good secondary source, nor are the later versions of it, because even the production of that documentary was so divisive that the producers published their own separate versions. It's really something to be avoided. From having watched the show, it appears that the script was mostly based on rules of engagement, and the advisors were brought in to wrangle the plot back on target. So it would be better to say it was based on the advisors themselves, not their books. But that's advertising for you. They gotta sell the product. All that being said, I think the advisors did an excellent job because the show turned out fairly accurate. 
The show managed to capture much of what happened at Waco. It's a huge and complex subject, and I've only touched the surface in this review. They did it in seven hours of enrapturing television, which is impressive given the contentious subject matter. And they don't stray away from the ugly bits. It delves into the underage polygamy that Koresh practiced. I, I love David, but I, I never had a choice in any of it. You think I would choose to share my husband? It tackles the fiasco of Ruby Ridge in its first episode. Even the fractiousness and insolence of the FBI is shown. Look at yourselves, all this. All this! You think this is really working? Good luck. Its portrayal of Koresh is largely sympathetic, and that is a good thing. Nothing can be accurate without understanding. For a cult so easily labeled as a bunch of whack jobs, we are supposed to at least empathize with their plight. They bicker about what to do, and the media pushes them further. It even attempts to show how Davidians became indoctrinated. I'm not exactly convinced by this, but the character being indoctrinated is the stand-in for the survivor who was on set. But I have to wonder how he did not just break out laughing when this was said. I've assumed the burden of sex for us all, but not for my own kicks. The actor who plays Koresh clearly studied recordings of the real deal and tried to emulate that as much as possible. A lot of actors do that kind of thing, but rarely do they go any further than mimicking mannerisms. Here, the actor brings to life a performance that consists of mostly quotations. In fact, a lot of this movie is composed of quotes. No joke. This is about as faithful as it gets. And when it comes to fidelity to the subject matter, it actually makes for good storytelling. That's what history is, after all. The story of us. So many directors and commenters say, It's just a movie, not a documentary. Yet the ones that are truly great manage to do better than most documentaries. It takes a great deal of ignorance to think that telling a true story is somehow unattainable. Especially when you advertise that it has some sort of basis. It's even worse to think that history is some plaything that someone can contort to their will. Waco manages to avoid all of that. I don't touch TV shows normally because so much work. Ugh. Plus, they are pretty universally dumb because the format mandates certain time constraints and plot contrivances. I honestly hope that Waco is a harbinger of things to come, but I can't sing its praises from the rooftops any longer. The show has its problems, and they complicate my ability to enjoy it, but I'm kinda happy about that. The two big questions surrounding the Waco Siege are always going to be divisive. They could easily have portrayed the Davidians as a gun-hoarding apocalypse cult, ready to kill the federal government at the slightest provocation. Then once the siege was about to end, they spread fuel all over the floor in order to martyr themselves. Alternately, this could have been about the government that was out there trying to kill everyone inside under no provocation. Both narratives are actually supported by evidence, yet completely contradictory. It also does not allow much nuance or ambiguity, a vital component of good history in my opinion. Instead, that ambiguity has to be generated through supposition. Essentially, the show had to make up large amounts of what the Branch Davidians experienced, especially in regards to those two looming questions. The first one is the most awkwardly executed. It opens the show with this. That's not my cut. When the show finally gets to that point, we see this as the first gunshots. I could see that happening, but that does not explain why the Davidians were so ready to shoot back. If they were truly acting in self-defense, the shooting from the Davidians would have to be depicted as taking a while to begin, since they would not have been ready to shoot back. Instead, the shootout is instantaneous. The show doesn't contemplate this, though. It just happens but is antithetical to the obvious intent. They were trying to depict it as though no one was to blame for the shootout, but instead landed with the courts by accident. Sometimes it's difficult to stand still on a moving train. 
On the second question, they're better. Instead of depicting anyone starting the fire, whether by accident or on purpose, they simply don't show it at all. The problem here is that it shows the Davidians cowering elsewhere in the building when the fire began. It missed a golden opportunity by showing this guy putting out a fire caused by a lantern getting knocked over. Instead, it discreetly implies that the FBI started the fire. But you really have to read into it to find these problems. There are some minor issues, like the FBI being depicted as only having one leader who wasn't a total douche about the situation. For a show willing to go out of its way to make the Davidians sympathetic, this is concerning. But I think that is due to the perspective of the advisors on set. This is why we can't just blindly trust primary sources. The negotiator was clearly jaded from the experience. Showing the perspectives of the other leaders would be important, but we only get his. There's also this radio host who's like a surrogate voice of reason for the audience. He's got neat little sound bites like these. Law enforcement and military force are two very different functions. Law enforcement is all about de-escalating conflict. They aren't allowed to shoot unless shot at. They strive toward a peaceful conclusion. Military force, on the other hand, is about inflicting more pain on an enemy than he can inflict on you. So I ask you, why is our government using military force on civilians? All of them. Standoff, tear gas, fire, death. The FBI knows this happens, and yet they made no plan to put out a fire if one started. But that pushes off what was actually happening. It's not like the big bad government was coming to get the sweet innocent Davidians. They were trafficking illegal armament from an isolated and fortified compound. That was the reason for the raid. Of course they came heavily armed. That is what should be expected with such charges. I think that the who shot first question is a bit of a red herring. First off, they were uniformed, they were wearing badges, they called out that they had a search warrant. At any point someone presented them with a threat to their lives or serious bodily injury, under the federal rules of engagement, they're authorized and expected to use deadly force. Only far-right extremists argue otherwise. We should not sympathize with a person peddling falsehoods. Lastly, there's this whole subplot with this ATF agent who was spying on the Davidians. It does fit Robert Rodriguez's testimony, but they depict it as though he was beginning to believe in the Branch Davidians' cause. But that is not the case at all. He also didn't think that the raid was unnecessary. He just thought that the timing was bad. Because once the Davidians knew about the raid, he thought that they were going to counterattack, which kind of happened. But these are all tiny narrative flaws, or they're simply executed in a way that could have been better. That's the thing though, they challenge our perception. The show is not neutral, nor is it completely the truth. But it also falls on multiple sides in trying to be truthful, just as the truth actually does. It's complicated in a way I find endlessly fascinating. That's what makes this good. It's not perfect, nor can it be. Mistakes are inevitable. You'll see the angry comments below saying I'm acting perfect too, but any regular viewer will know that I make mistakes all the time. Making mistakes reveals the storyteller's humanity, especially on a subject that is entirely about humanity. Mistakes are fine as long as they are honest mistakes. I have never read a history book without errors or problems. And this is on that level. They gave it their all, and the only problems show up if you pick at the seams of a fairly robust work.